Welcome back to the Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about becoming expert. Riley said one day, I don't know how to voice my accomplishments. Before our coaching had begun, Janice, Riley's boss, made it clear she supported Riley 110%. Janice experienced Riley as honest, open, diligent, thorough, accurate, but she felt Riley needed a bigger presence. Janice's goal for the coaching was that Riley become more visible. At this stage of the coaching, Riley and I were discussing whether she could create a bigger presence by changing how she talked about herself at work. And that's what had prompted her I can't voice my accomplishments comment. She went on, you know a moment I really hate. These presentations to the board, I make them every month. The presentations themselves are fine. It's the moments before. I get brought into the room when it's my turn, you know, but these are all-day meetings. Between presentations, they get up, they get a drink, they go pee, they start talking with each other. I'm stuck twiddling my thumbs, and no matter what I do, I feel like I'm the kid who wandered in on the grown-ups. What happens, I asked. Well, here's where I am a total nitwit when it comes to talking about myself. You know, inevitably, someone wanders over. They see me every month, but they don't really know me. So the person says, remind me what you do exactly. Oh, that is the moment I hate. Why, I asked. Well... You know, I don't want to just start bragging about myself, but, you know, at the same time, I know it's an opportunity. So I usually tell them about the report I'm about to give, but, you know, that's all about this diversity and inclusion project. But I'm not a diversity and inclusion person. No, you're the open person, right? Riley's expertise was in a sector called open. She said, Oh, but I don't want to start yapping about open. Believe me, no one understands it. Could you give them a headline about open, I asked? Not really. That's the problem. Really, I asked? That is surprising. I have never met a topic I couldn't headline. Well, I'll take your word for it for now, but we might come back to that. I said, can we take another tack? I didn't know we were on one, she said, so sure. I asked... Would you build us a list? She swung her pad around. Sure, what sort of list? I said, build a list of everything you do well. Think over the course of a year. You do all sorts of things, right? Build a list of the ones you're really good at. I stopped talking. She thought and wrote, and thought and wrote. She ended up with a list of ten items, ranging from management skills to her gift with data to her oral and written skills. After she read the list to me, I said, That's a nice list. Does that feel like bragging? No, she replied. Oh, good, I said. But am I right that sometimes talking about yourself does feel like bragging? Oh, yeah. Oh, I am super allergic to bragging. I even hear myself telling my daughters to stop bragging. I laughed. How does that go over? Riley had 12-year-old twin girls. She laughed. They're great, actually. They are completely sunshiny about their bragging. They say, we're not bragging, Mom. It's who we are. And they flaunt on out. The concept of bragging has no meaning to them. Does that annoy you, I asked? No. I'd love to be as bold as they are, but I'm not. I pointed back at the pad. You said that didn't feel like bragging. She gave that a thought. Oh, no, it didn't, did it? Why not, do you suppose? I don't know, I said. Why not? I'm not sure, she said. Maybe because you asked me to think over the span of a year. I had to helicopter out of myself, you know, look from higher up. From up there, it's easier to see patterns, right? Patterns are like evidence. It's not bragging if you have evidence. That made me laugh, I suppose. Looking at her pad, she said... So now I have this nice non-bragging list. What do I do with it? Whip it out when some board member asks me what I do? I said, well, look at the ten items and see if any of them naturally cluster together. You're looking for labels. See if you can cluster two or three or four items under one label. From her list of ten, 
she came up with four labels. Her four labels were People, Process, Insights, Outreach. I asked, okay, so keep those four labels in mind, and now think about one of those awkward boardroom interactions. Would having those four labels change anything? She came up blank. Change how? I said, suppose you get the what do you do exactly question. Well, now you have four different folders you could talk about, people and process and the others. And those folders have more folders inside them. And knowing you have those topics ready to go, would that make a difference? What would I say, she asked, like, I do people or... I do process. That sounds like a real conversation starter. I laughed and then said, well, how about something like this? Uh, One thing I'm focusing on these days is insights. Or one thing I'm known for is how I work with my people. How about something like that? She drew away and squinted. That's right on the edge of bragging. Well, nevertheless, could you do it, I asked. She tested the words, These days I'm focusing a lot on insights and outreach. Huh, yeah. And if they want to know more, I can tell them more, right? I nodded but didn't speak. I get it, she said. And to answer your question, then yes, having labels like that would make a difference. Where else could I use this? Anywhere. Like in a meeting, she asked. Oh, absolutely. Meetings are perfect, I said. And what does that sound like? Well... Start by choosing a label that would match your role in the meeting, let's say insights. Okay, she said. So during the meeting, you're going to put that label in front of you like a pair of glasses. It's going to be constantly focusing how you see things. Like a filter, she said. Right. During that meeting, every idea you hear, every comment you make is going to go through the filter called insights. And what does that translate into, she asked. I said, so let's say some ideas being bounced around. You're going to contribute your ideas in a minute. Hold on, wait, Riley, you do contribute your ideas in meetings, don't you? Oh, yes, she said with a sly smile. Good. So an idea is being discussed, and you've been listening through your insights filter, right? Right, she said. When your turn comes, you begin by naming your filter. You say something like, I'm listening to this through the lens of insights, and what occurs to me is... Or you say something like, if I put my insights hat on, what comes to mind is... That's nice, she said. I'm naming my expertise. I nodded in agreement, but didn't speak. She smiled at me as if she'd figured out a secret. I could do this every day, couldn't I? Like, I could be talking to Janice and say, you know, the people part of me thinks that's a great idea, but the process part of me has some doubt. I nodded in agreement. She seemed pleased, and then she said, what was the idea you said we'd go back for? Oh, right, I said, thanks, yeah. So remember I asked if you could headline open and you said no? Yeah. Well, I still think we could find a headline, but... In the meantime, you can use your labels to talk about open. If you want to be the open expert, tell people what filters you use when you think about open. And how would that sound, she asked. Well, you say something like, you know, open is really complex. But, you know, no matter where I find myself in the open world, I find myself solving problems using the same four tools over and over, people, processes, insights, and outreach. Oh, she said, it's just another way to name my expertise. Oh, that's great. And it wouldn't feel like bragging, I asked. No, she said, you know why not? Because I think it's helpful. I'm telling people how to listen to my ideas. That's helpful. Oh, good, I said. And besides, she said, it's accurate. I really do use those filters when I think about my work. It's not bragging if it's fact. Great. You know what this is like, she asked, as if it were a delicious secret. This is like a hypnotic suggestion. If I could keep saying I'm good at insights, sooner or later when people talk about insights, someone's going to say, you know, we've got to talk to Riley. She's the expert at insights. Yes, I said, that is exactly what happens. But it must take time, she countered. Oh, it does, I said. 
So repetition is important, said Riley. It is, I agreed. Riley got fierce about looking through and naming her four filters, asserting her expertise, led her to having a bigger presence, which inevitably led her to the look and sound of leadership. I actually did this exercise with a client recently, and it really helped her. What makes this exercise different from ones like Act As If or Animating Your Persona is that this one starts with you building a list of your strengths. That's just a different way to start. If you'd like to start positioning yourself as an expert in something, but you're not exactly sure what, building a list of your strengths is a great way to start. It works. So that's one big idea. Start by building a list of your strengths. Now, I have three more ideas about becoming expert. The first one is about the labels. So, look, you might find your labels by building a list of your strengths, but you also might want to position yourself around a topic or a process or a program, right? Well, if so, just be real, be accurate. You can't say you're an expert in something just because it's something you aspire to. I do think people got away with that in the early 20th century. And people just said they were something and they became that. There's a wonderful story of a producer in Hollywood who came in, sat down at a desk and put up a sign that said general manager. And he became the general manager of that part of the studio. People did that in those days. I don't think you can get away with it anymore. The point of the story is about you and your labels. I don't think you just name yourself an expert in something just because. So here's a good rule of thumb. You know, don't name yourself an expert in something unless you're one of the top performers in that area, whatever that area is. Okay, that's about the labels. (laughs) Two ideas to go. You hear me sorting and labeling, right? Do you remember right at the end of Riley's story, she said, so repetition's good, right? And I agreed. Allow me to split that hair with you. Repetition is good. If your goal is like Riley's goal, that when people think of a topic, they think of you, well, that simply can't happen without repetition. And it happens over time, maybe years. It's a long game. So my caution about repetition is just that. Be careful. If every time you open your mouth, you mention your expertise every time, it will be obnoxious. I mean, people will just start rolling their eyes. But it's a bind, right? I mean, you need to give voice to your expertise often enough for it to take root, but not so often that people just want to shut it out. So here's how I think about that balance. There are a lot of things in my life that are just a part of me, things I love to talk about, right? I have a lot to contribute to these things, things like van life or circus life or addiction or adoption or progressive education or whatever it is. I'm always ready to jump into those topics with my own perspective, and I'm willing to name my expertise there. So I'm aware. I have those filters in me, and I'm confident about naming them as my expertise at any time, but I don't feel compelled to name them all the time. Same with yours. You need to have your labels accessible and ready, yes. You need to have confidence and be comfortable naming them, yes. And you need to have some radar about when the time is right. But when the time is right, go, speak your expertise, which leads me to the last idea. Why people don't speak their expertise. I'm going to share that in a minute, but first I have to tell you about something so cool that happened this month. We got our first review posted in the iTunes store in Lithuania. If you're in Lithuania's iTunes store, which if you want to do, I can tell you how to do that. Send me an email, I'll let you know. And if you go to the Look and Sound of Leadership page in the Lithuania's iTunes store, you will see a brand new review from a listener with the username Iveta Justate. It is the sole review from Lithuania. Thank you. It was such a delight to see that. Thank you, Iveta Justate. But wait, there's more. A listener with the handle Akerskug posted a review in Sweden, and that is our second review in Sweden, so thank you too. And then closer to home, in Canada, Country Robin in the Big City, S33 Sheffield, and in the U.S., Nelly33, Nick Tio Mom, Sleech66, Gus McRae, AA777, and Chad Horenfeldt. 
thanks to all of you. I'm so grateful for what you write in your reviews. It is lovely to read. Thank you. If you haven't posted a review yet, I hope you will. The podcast world is so crowded now. One of the things that distinguishes this podcast is that it has been monthly for 11 years. That distinguishes it in the algorithms, but so do your reviews, no matter what country you're in. So thank you. Okay, to our final point. Why don't people speak their expertise? What I hear most often is that people feel uncomfortable talking about themselves. They feel it's bragging, that it's somehow inappropriate. I want to give you a challenge, and I want to tell you about a resource. Here's the challenge. Do you remember in the episode when I modeled for Riley something, and she replied, ooh, that's right on the edge of bragging, and I asked her, nevertheless, could you do it? That's the challenge. I understand it's uncomfortable, but only because it's new. Only because you don't know what's going to happen. It's like standing on the high diving board deciding whether to jump or not. You know, there's a rational part of you that says it's okay, and there's an irrational part of you that just makes you feel like you're being squeezed by a vice. The challenge is to trust the rational part of you. Push past the discomfort. You know, if you're really worried about it, try it in low-risk settings. Say it across the dinner table to your partner one night. Or, look, try it on your kids. They won't even notice. That is really safe. But take the challenge, feel the fear, and do it anyway. The resource. It's a book. I haven't mentioned it in years. It's by a woman named Peggy Klaus. It's called Brag, The Art of Tooting Your Own Horn Without Blowing It. I love that title. The book is really helpful for exactly what we're talking about here. It is just so useful. If you want some help, get the book. You'll thank me. And of course, there are more resources that you don't have to order. They're free. Those are the resources from The Look and Sound of Leadership. You can search the archive using these four filters for women, executive presence, perception, how you're perceived, and self-talk. The Archive is part of the Essential Communications website. It's EssentialCom.com. It's EssentialCom with two M's dot com. Click the podcast tab, and every past episode is there for you, and you can search by the subjects like for women. If you want to find specific episodes that relate to becoming expert, five you might look at are Act As If, Acting on the Corporate Stage, Personal Branding, Speaking Your Truth, and The Look and Sound of Self-Esteem. Don't forget to send your questions to us for the Ask the Coaches episode that Mindy, Dana, and I are going to do. And that's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening.